Good day everyone and welcome to our webinar for November 2023. Uh, what you see on your screen is a chart of course of the S&P 500 and we'll start there in America. Um, at, the last, um, at the last webinar, which was at the beginning of last month, on the first Wednesday of last month, uh, as you can see here, the S&P 500 was just on, its, on a touch point of this upward trend line. You see the upward trend line begins in October at the low here of 2022, and then we had a, f a second touch point there, and then it's, this was the third touch point when uh, we had the last webinar. And I said at the time it will bounce off this touch point and move up, which is what it did. But then the economic news showed that the US economy was still growing rapidly. And this growth was despite 11 interest rate hikes totaling 5%. In fact, the U.S. economy created 336,000 new jobs in September month, just in that one month. That's almost 50% more than it created in August, and 80% above what economists were expecting. Gross domestic product, seasonally adjusted and after inflation, grew by 4.9% in the third quarter. That's a remarkable rate of growth for such a big economy. And that was up from the second quarter's growth of 2.1%. Consumer spending was up 4% in the third quarter, the fastest growth in three years. Residential fixed investment was up 3.9%, which shows that the housing market was very strong and very healthy. These indications show that the U.S. economy is growing rapidly. And of course that raises the specter of further interest rate hikes. It's possible that the Monetary Policy Committee of the Federal Reserve Bank will raise interest rates further in order to cool the economy. Because clearly the 11 interest rate hikes that they've done so far have in been insufficient. At the very least, rates are expected to remain high at these high levels for longer than was expected. And of course this has been causing the S&P 500 to reverse. And the index broke sharply down through that trend line as you can see here on the chart and came down to a new low level over here uh, at 4117. And that happened a couple of days ago and it looks like it may have bounced off that off that low level. Looking at the inflation rate, the CPI in America came in at 3.7% year-on-year in September, and that was above expectations but slightly down from August's 3.9%. Core inflation, which is the figure that the Federal Reserve Bank pays the most attention to, was 4.1% above August's 3.9% and still well above the Fed's goal of 2%. Obviously the progress of the S&P 500, however, is determined by the profits of the 500 companies which make it up. So far, 42% of those companies have reported their results for the third quarter. More than 80% of those companies are reporting profits above analysts' expectations. Total earnings are up 11%, and that uh, and revenue was up 4.4% on average for the third quarter of, seven, uh, uh, of this year. This, together with those massive job creation numbers, shows that U.S. companies are still growing rapidly. The economy is not slowing. If anything, it's speeding up. In the short term, this growth has caused the S&P 500 to, to fall because of rate hike fears, right, as we've discussed. But sooner or later, it will be positive for the S&P 500 because of the impact on the company profits. Last night, the S&P 500 bounced 1.2%, sorry, not, bounced 0.6%, bounced and that was after the previous night's 1.2% gain, showing that the positive sentiment is still outweighing negative sentiment. Technically, of course, it's very significant that the upward trend line, which is on your chart here, has been broken. 
this break is technically significant and as you can see we've got a new downward trend appearing here but we remain convinced that the S&P 500 will bottom out soon if it hasn't already and in time we expect it to rise above its previous cycle high over here uh, at 4589 which was made on the 31st of July uh, this year one consequence of a strong economy is that bond yields are moving higher. The yield on the, ten -year, on the US 10-year Treasury bill went above 5% briefly and is now at around about 4.88%, so it's very high. The massive job creation and strong economy are obviously good for President Biden in his 2000 campaign, 2024 campaign for re-election. Republicans cannot really point at a weak economy. The probable Republican nominee, Donald Trump, is also mired in a web of legal battles. More and more of his co-defendants are flipping on him to become state witnesses. The Republicans' extraordinary difficulty in appointing a new speaker for the House has damaged them and damaged their image in the country. So we expect Biden to win the 2024 election, despite his age. South African investors, of course, will be interested to know how all of this is impacting on the JSE. So let's look at the uh, JSE overall index quickly. Right, I just want to put a bit more data on the screen. Here you can see the JSC overall index um, and you will see that it recorded a, an all-time record high of 80791 on the 27th of January. So the low before that was at 6324 in September 2022 and then it rallied very strongly to this peak. After that it drifted sideways and downwards for quite a while. Um, and, and obviously that that was turned down that that sideways downwards movement s turned down sharply from when wall street started to fall over here uh, on the 31st of july this year so it's falling quite rapidly but we don't expect it to fall very far we expect that uh, it will rally like the s p 500 what is notable is that it is now 14 percent from its peak it's 14 percent down from this peak level and that compares with wall street which only fell about 10 percent which demonstrates further that the fact that the jsc is more volatile than the s p 500 it falls further in a downward trend and rises further in an upward trend. Now Wall Street is about to turn up again, so we expect the JSE to follow it up. Okay, let's turn our attention to Europe and to the war in Ukraine. The war, of course, has continued over this past month since I spoke to you last, without much change in the front line. Ukraine has been fending off substantial Russian attacks, especially around the town of Andivka. Russia has incurred substantial losses in both men and military machines, such as tanks and uh, troop carriers, without much gain. President Zelensky says Russia has lost about 4,000 men and 400 vehicles in its attempt to retake Andivka. The Ukrainians have crossed the left bank of the Dnipro River in strength, and they've taken control of about half of the vi village of Krinky. They've managed to control, gain control of the high ground west of Robertine, and that obviously is very significant from a strategic point of view. The Russians are apparently planning another major attack to try and take the chemical plant in Andivka. It seems to us that the Russians are expending an enormous amount of effort for very little gain. We believe that Russia cannot sustain this effort for much longer. What appears to be a long, drawn-out stalemate will probably be resolved fairly soon. Behind the, scene, the, behind the scenes, there are forces which are already in progress, which will bring it to an end. The Russian economy is in a state of collapse, as can be seen 
by the weakness of the ruble. The Russian central bank has had to hike interest rates yet again to 15%, up from 13%, and more or less double what they were just three months ago. This radical move has managed to hold the ruble just above one cent, one US cent, but only just. By the way, that compares with South African Rand, which is trading at about five US cents. We expect the ruble to continue falling soon, and with it, the Russian economy. Right, let's turn our attention to South Africa. The big news in South Africa is, of course, that South Africa won the Rugby World Cup. And we are in the semi-finals for the cricket. We are all fiercely proud of these amazing achievements. But what should we take from this? I think we should realize that if South Africa can produce a world-class, multiracial rugby and cricket team, then we should also be able to produce a world-class, multiracial government. That is something we sorely need in this country. The 2024 election is just a few months away, and it is an important opportunity. We must use it to swap corruption and indolence for competence and diligence. We should appoint people to lead us based on their merits, not on their race. Just, to, just as we have in our national rugby and cricket teams, we need to forget about race and become a meritocracy. Then we will have a world-class government. Looking at the economy, South African gross domestic product grew by 0.6% in the second quarter, which was somewhat better than expected, but the third quarter is expected to only be a growth around 0.1%. Mining production was down 4.4% year-on-year in July and then 2.5% in August. Manufacturing was up 2.2% in July and 1.6% in August. Demand for commodities has obviously fallen worldwide. Lower prices and profits for the mining companies are a big problem. The World Bank's minerals index is down 11%. And that, of course, is causing a tax shortfall, which is impacting on the budget. That tax shortfall is estimated to be roughly 70 billion in the current tax year. And that comes about because of the collapse of commodity prices, with platinum group metals down 50% in US dollars. Mining tax revenues have fallen about 60 billion rand. And it also comes because of, a, of rapidly falling company profits which are due to load shedding, higher interest rates and the general, generally recessionary conditions in the economy. And of course that, that lack of income must be combined with the government's overspending which is resulting in a much higher deficit. The impact of the SRD grant um, the civil service pay hike and the fact that the government has taken on 254 billion rand of Eskom's debt are all combining to make the deficit worse. And now Transnet is asking for 65 billion dollar a rand for debt repayments and 100 billion rand for further infrastructure development and maintenance. The recently appointed board of Transnet wants the Treasury to take half of its, 60, uh, of its 130 billion rand debt on and then to give it a further 47 billion rand in cash as an injection. Overall, the fiscal picture is very bad. South Africa is moving rapidly towards a debt trap. Right now, about 18 cents of every rand of tax that is collected goes to just pay the interest on the debt. Of course, this has happened many times elsewhere in, in African countries. Inevitably, the government has then resorted to just printing money, as happened in Zimbabwe. Printing money, of course, eventually causes the collapse of the current currency and ultimately of the economy. The only feasible answer is to allow business to take over some of these essential functions. Because the simple truth is, the ANC has shown that it is completely incapable of running any large organization or project. South Africans as a nation must accept and understand this fact. 
In the meantime, this government is spending far more than it is bringing in. It keeps trying to undertake expensive projects like the NHI, which it lacks the skills to manage. Enoch Gorongwana, our Minister of Finance, asserts that the government is not run out of money, but the deficit, which is currently at 73% of GDP, is now expected to rise to over 80%. Social grants cost the government around 22 billion rand every month, 17% of the tax collected. The parents of 13 million children get 500 rand a month each as a child grant. 4 million people over the age of 60 get 2,080 rand a month each as a pension. And the rest of the social grants go to people with disabilities. The SRD pays 350 rand a month to a further 8.5 million indigent people and that is expected to rise to 490 rand. The cost of all this is enormous, but it has prevented millions of people from descending into starvation. The consumer price index in South Africa rose for the second month in a row to 5.4%, driven by food and fuel prices. Core inflation, which excludes food and fuel, fell to 4.5%. Clearly, South Africa is suffering from the twin impacts of a rising oil price and a falling rand. Petrol on the high felt is at the highest price it has been for over a year. Egg and chicken prices rose in response to the massive culling as a result of the avian flu that, that beset the chicken industry. The rise in inflation will impact on the MPC's decision on whether to raise interest rates in November especially considering that there is now a possibility of a further rate hike in the U.S. In September, retail trade was down for the 13th month in a row, and that shows the decline in consumer spending caused by load shedding and higher interest rates. Private se sector credit extension dropped to 4.4% in August from July's 5.9%. High interest rates are stopping households and businesses from taking on new debt. The APSA Purchasing Managers Index fell to 45.4 in September from August 49.7. That shows that manufacturing is shrinking. The economy is in a bad place at the moment, with also with the falling commodity prices. The business component of the PMI fell sharply to 41.9 from August 50. New vehicle sales fell for the second month in a row in September. Car sales were down to 8.5%. Year-to-date, sales are down 2.5%. Again, this shows that consumers are unwilling to take on more debt to buy cars. <clears throat> there are plenty of applications being made for new finance, but very few are being approved. BankServe's ta average take-home pay came in at 15,673 Rand for the average South African household. That's 4% up on August month. And that's beneficial. That shows an improvement. This is probably because businesses are being less impacted by load shedding and uh, they are able to increase uh, their, their, their wage bill. The BETI, which is the Bank Serves uh, 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 Interbank Transactions Index, dropped 2%, showing the, the slowing of the economy. Many economic indicators have turned negative in the past 18 months. Over the past three months, the petrol price has risen by 3 rand 19 per litre, and diesel is up 5 rand 53 per litre. These cost increases are impacting the level of inflation and economic growth. So it is evident that South African consumers are taking enormous strain at the moment. All the major banks are reporting a sharp increase in bad debts, and in impairments. Capitec's provision for bad debts is up 62%. Standard Bank has hiked its provision 42%. ABSA by 60% and Nedbank by 47%. Most defaults are in the mortgage bond repayments for people who've got a house and a mortgage bond can't, can't continue their repayments. Or, alternatively, people who've got a loan, their repayments are also in default most commonly. 
Consumers are using their savings and their debt facilities to buy groceries. 67% of households report that unmanageable debt is affecting their mental health. Clearly these conditions do not bode well for the ANC in next year's election. Recent studies indicate that they will only get about 41% of the vote. Maybe less. Okay, let's look at the RAND. Let's get us back on the screen here. Um, where am I? There. Right, so the RAND. Um, the RAND continues to be the whipping boy of emerging market currencies. It reflects every shift from risk off to risk on and risk on to risk off in the international environment. As you can see from the chart here, we reached our weakest level at just below 20 Rand to the US dollar over here. Uh, that was in May this year. And the Rand seems to have found some support around 19 Rand 20 to the US dollar over here uh, at the moment. But it is very volatile. It has the potential to keep falling. And the stuttering local growth and political uncertainty in South Africa as a result of the elections which are coming up is not helping. Sentiment is probably close to the, to the worst it has been for the RAND, as the S&P is at the bottom of a cycle. We could probably expect some improvement as Wall Street recovers over the next few weeks. Okay, I want to just talk about a little bit about a few general points. It's very disturbing to me that Gauteng loses about 40, 34% of the water that it, that it delivers to businesses and households through leaks and uh, people stealing water. Water is going to be a big problem in this country in the coming years with El Nino impending and the rains may be far worse than usual over the next two to three years. Gauteng's three metros, which are Joburg, Chwane and Ekuruleni, are all doing water shedding now. Many businesses require a reliable water supply to function and make profits. The minister says that 90 billion rand is needed to repair water infrastructure and he says that the system is losing about 3.7 million liters of water a day to leaks and theft. Okay, ne next point. Uh, the long-dated government bond in South Africa has been, the yield on it has been rising, probably in tandem with the yield on the long-dated bonds in America. Um, after COVID in March 2020, the yield on the 10-year bond reached 13.3%, which is what you would expect in a crisis like that. Last week, it reached 12.95%, just below that level, mainly due to load shedding, the budget deficit, which is expected to be far higher than it has been, and far lower tax revenue. There is also concern over the South African government's long-term stability. That extra risk is resulting in investors demanding a much higher return on their investment. The next point. It is a severe indictment of the ANC that one in four children in South Africa has stunted growth due to malnutrition. Research by ShopRite shows that 52% of people in South Africa face what they call food insecurity. And that is defined as having several days in the year when they do not eat, simply because they can't afford to buy food. And this is a direct consequence of decades of mismanagement of the economy. The ANC's mismanagement of the economy over the past 30 years is clearly to blame. And this statistic will definitely impact voting in next year's election, as it should. On the 1st of January 2024, the Americans will decide whether South Africa can continue to be part of the African Growth and Opportunity Act. This will be a vital decision for the future of our economy. A massive slice of our manufacturing exports, especially motor vehicles, depends on AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. A 
Americans are unhappy about our relationship with Russia and things that we do, such as joint military operations with the Russians and so forth. But the Americans will probably use a goa to keep us from moving closer to Russia and China. The United States Senator John Kennedy says a goa membership should be extended to 20 years from 10 years. Obviously, the BRICS alliance and the massive Chinese funding in Africa are a direct threat to American interests on this continent. Okay, let's talk a little bit about ESKIM. The steady decline in the average energy available and availability factor, or the EAF, shows ESKIM's decline. In 2021, the average energy availability was 63.2%. In 2022, it had dropped to 596 and this year, 2023, it is down at 54.4%. This pattern shows that businesses and households are absolutely right to invest in their own solar power and to get away from Eskom. The massive 18.6% increase in electricity tariffs this year is driving people away from Eskom, and it is charging fewer and fewer clients more and more money for what they get. Rooftop solar has doubled since August 2022. So in a year, we now have 5 megawatts of power being generated from rooftop installations. And Eskom's income has dropped by 1%. Municipalities are now complaining because of the sharp drop in their electricity revenues. Um, <laughs> that's quite a, an interesting statistic. The Saldana Bay municipality is to get 100 megawatts of power from independent power producers within the next three years. This will make it completely independent of Eskom, and in fact it may even be able to sell power back to the grid. Saldana uses about 65 megawatts of power at peak load, but that is after the closure of the Oxella Metal steel mill in Saldana Bay. That closure in 2019 cost the Saldana area 15,000 jobs both directly and indirectly. Okay, let's look at some commodities. Um, first, I'd like to start by looking at platinum group metals. Prices have dropped for platinum group metals by about 50% in US dollars and about 30% in rands. This obviously has a direct impact on the price of shares like Sibanye and Amplatz. So let's just quickly look at the platinum chart here. Um, in dollars, this is the platinum chart in dollars coming up. Right, I actually want to put, yeah, say 10 years, a little bit more than 10 years on the chart, just to give you an idea of the long term picture in platinum. Platinum is a very, very important metal. For this country at the moment generates more foreign currency than gold sorry i'm just pulling in data from the from the side here just to show you these long-term picture okay so this goes back to the sum prime crisis in 2008 and why i wanted to do that is to show you that there is a support level quite a strong support level at 790 dollars Obviously, this spike down here is the COVID-19 spike. Uh, but you see now that in current days, we are, we are in a downward trend here. Um, and that, and that, is, that is having a bad impact on South Africa. Platinum has fallen from about $1,272 in, in, uh, in February 2021, which is over here where I'm pointing to current levels uh, <clears throat> around $877. Palladium over the same period has fallen from $3,000 in March 2022 to just $1,135. The price of Sabania shares has dropped from 75 Rand a share to current prices around 23 Rand and Amplatz is down from 25, 20, 25 Rand a share to just 6 Rand a share. In fact, Amplatz is reconsidering its 4 billion rand investment in the Mogalakwena mine in Limpopo because of the drop in platinum prices. The fall in the rand has obviously helped to soften the blow for mining companies. 
but Sibanya is still looking to retrench 4,000 staff as it closes unprofitable mines. Coronation Fund Managers, one of the biggest fund managers in South Africa, has said that it is selling all its platinum shares. It has in fact sold all its platinum shares. It says that the future is bad, the long-term future is bad, especially with the development of electric vehicles. PGMs are about 40%, PGM mines account for about 40% of the half a million employees in the mining sector in South Africa. They are also obviously a major contributor to, to taxes. Okay, let's look at gold. Gold is also very interesting. Right. Okay, this is the gold price over the last five years. And uh, you obviously realize that gold is a hedge against the weakness of paper currencies. You will recall the impact of the Ukraine crisis. By the way, here's COVID-19. You see that in March of 2020. There it is. That's the spike down there. But note this resistance at 2015. Here's the Ukraine crisis. And as you can see, the gold price shot up uh, after in February 2022 uh, to reach that, that resistance level at 2050. Then it fell back, made a triple bottom over here and started a new upward trend, which again bounced that resistance at 2025 made a cycle high there at 2036 2038 on the 13th of april now you can see the attacks in israel by hamas have caused the gold price to spike up again and it will test this 2050 level probably again what is interesting to us is that uh, the the the, the run-up in gold here due to the attack in Israel is nothing like as big as the run-up in gold from there to there in the Ukraine war when that started. So it shows that investors, international investors, generally regard the Hamas attack and the war between Israel and Hamas as being a far less important war than that uh, in Ukraine. And you can use the gold price to assess the importance of international conflicts uh, generally in this way. Okay, let's turn our attention to a few companies to look at. Obviously, the JSC is, in the, is at the end of a downtrend following Wall Street. Most shares, even high-quality blue-chip shares, have been falling. But in our view, that downtrend is either over or almost over which means that there may be buying opportunities to pick up quality shares cheap. A major factor impacting on the prices of shares on the JSC has been the net selling by overseas investors. Over the past 17 years, foreigners have sold more than they have bought each year. This year, they have sold about 100 billion rands worth of shares and 1 billion just in the last week up until Friday last week. They also last week sold about 12 billion rands worth of government bonds. This net selling keeps the rand under pressure, of course. And one factor, of course, is the major risk-off sentiment on world markets as Wall Street is at the bottom of a cycle. Local factors which impact on the rand are load shedding, uncertainty over next year's elections, and of course the massive budget deficit which we are just about to find out about in the budget, which will be recorded later on today. There has been a noticeable loss of confidence in the South African economy by international investors, though, that I can tell you. We believe, however, that the RAND will improve when Wall Street turns up. There's quite a strong relationship between the RAND and the level of the S&P 500. So, there are some opportunities in this rather negative situation. Uh, one one thing that we should just draw your attention to, there was a new listing during the month, Primary Health Properties, or PHP, listed on the 24th of October. This is a real estate investment trust which owns healthcare properties in the UK and Ireland. About 90% of its income comes from government rentals to the NHS, or Ireland's equivalent health uh, authority. It is listed on the London Stock Exchange and it has 514 properties, 
494 of which are in the UK. It is also listed on the JSC with a secondary listing. The objective of that, of course, is to diversify its shareholdings. It is clearly a rand hedge and should become an institutional favorite. Okay, let's look at a property share, another property share, a local one, and that is Baldwin. Um, Baldwin is an interesting share. Um, I'm going to put all the data on the screen that we have since it listed in 2015. And as you can see, during that whole time, the share has been falling. But it is South Africa's largest property developer. It develops the residential units in secure complexes. It is obviously very sensitive to the state of the economy and to consumers' disposable income. Its products are generally, however, in high demand, especially in the Western Cape. In the six months to the 31st of August 2023, the company reported headline earnings per share were up 4%. It, during the six-month period, it scaled back its business, reducing costs and cutting its rate of construction because of the e situation in the economy. It sold only 834 units compared with the 1,360 that it sold in the same six months last year. At the same time, though, it improved its gross profit from 33, its profit margin from 33%, uh, sorry, to 33% from 26%. This shows that the company's ability to respond quickly to market conditions is there. But here's the key point about this company. The share, as you see it here, is trading for 226 cents a share. But it has a net asset value of 849 cents, which means that it's trading at about a 75% discount to the value of the assets which it owns. And those assets are mostly property shares, which are obviously very secure. So we believe that this share is actually incredibly cheap at these levels. Uh, it's on a price earnings ratio of 2.47. And it's on a dividend yield of just around five, uh, 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 well, of 8.5%, as you can see from the chart on your screen. This makes it incredibly good value for the investor. And we think that uh, sooner or later it will attract somebody's attention, and especially amongst the institutions, and the share will start to go up. Okay, the next share I want to look at is Clicks. This is obviously a long-term favorite of ours. Uh, everybody knows Clicks. Everybody knows what they do. And they've once again produced an excellent set of results. Um, just going to go here to a candlestick chart, and I'm going to put more data on the screen. Oh no, you know what? Let's stay with the price chart, because I'm going to put all the data on the screen. And the reason I want to do that is to show you the long-term pattern in this share. Um, but in its results for the year to the 31st of August 2023, revenue was up 8.2%, and retail turnover was up 12.2%. Headline earnings per share rose by 11.5% against a background of load shedding, depressed consumer spending, and high interest rates. In other words, this is a very defensive share um, during periods of economic downturn. The company is growing its market share in all its product categories. It's also growing by acquisition. During the period it, brought, it bought Sorbet with 194 outlets. It also bought Mchem which is a 24-hour pharmacy in the Western Cape, and another company called 180 Degrees, which writes software for pharmacies. We believe it is a must-have for every private shareholder's in portfolio. Over the last 28 years, this share has gone from 300 cents in 1996 to current prices around 264 rand and 56 cents. It's, it's gone from 300 cents to 26,456 cents in that period of time. This year, this year, it has paid shareholders a dividend of 679 cents per share, more than double what the share would have cost you to buy in 1996. Okay, so we really like that one. Okay, Bytes Technology, 
um, is the next chair I want to look at. This is the UK's one of the UK's leading um, AI companies. So it's involved in software, uh, cloud, cloud technology, and IT security for companies and artificial intelligence. And it's one of the leading software companies in the UK. It's an excellent rand hedge and it reports in British pound sterling. In its results for the six months to the 31st of August 2023, it produced a gross dividend income of one billion pound sterling. That's 37.6% up on the same period in the six months last year. Earnings per share rose by 17% and it paid out a dividend of 2.7 pence per share which is a 12.5% 12 12 increase on its dividend from last year. It reports strong demand for security, cloud adoption, and digital transformation. And it increased its headcount by 10% to more than 1,000 employees. Now the share has been falling uh, since its high in June. That's over here. That's high. Um, and we believe it now looks like very good value. So... Take a look at that one if you're interested. Okay, the, the next share I want to talk about is Life Healthcare. This is obviously a hospital and medical group with extensive, extensive operations in South Africa. Um, now, what's important about Life Healthcare is that um, It used to be a favorite institutional share, as you can see from the chart here. And it actually reached a high of 40, 46, 47 Rand uh, back in September 2014. But for the last 10 years, the share has been falling. It seems to have found some support at around 1,640 cents. It's about to produce its financials for the year to the 30th of September 2023. It'll It'll publish those on the 16th of November. And it estimates that headline earnings per share will be up by between 10% and 29%. The company recently sold its UK subsidiary, AMG, to release 8.4 billion rand into the hands of shareholders. This will be given to them in the form of a dividend or in the form of share buybacks. It has also used the proceeds to substantially reduce its debt. The healthcare business is obviously a very defensive business as well, not much impacted by recessions. But life shares have been falling for nine years, and it now looks like at very good value at current levels. The price earnings ratio has fallen from 27 at its peak to 17 now. And the share has good support around that 1640 cent level. All right, last share I want to look at is Famous Brands. Famous Brands is obviously a very well-known South African company. It's the leading food franchiser in this country with uh, 2,898 restaurants. Almost every restaurant you go to in South Africa is a Famous Brands franchise. Okay, so uh, this share uh, took a big pounding during COVID-19 because obviously restaurants had to close or they were only allowed to provide takeaway foods and so forth. Uh, and in fact, the share dropped to as low as uh, 2,300 cents down here. So from its peak, if we go back and look at it in the whole chart, this is all the data I've got. You can see here, it reached a peak over here. Um, it reached a peak there of 172 rand 80 cents in October 2016. Since that peak, it's been falling, and that fall uh, culminated with the collapse due to COVID-19, which you see here on the screen. That resulted in a share dropping to 23 Rand. It broke up through its trend line, its downward trend line, over here uh, in March of 2021. right? And since then, it's gone up strongly. So now the share is trading for uh, 58 Rand 65, and in its results for the six months to the 31st of August 2023, revenue was up 10% and headline earnings per share was, was slightly down at 7% down, mainly because of its need to invest in load shedding to give its restaurants backup electricity during load shedding. 
But now 91.3% of all its restaurants have an alternative or backup power system. The company has substantial debt. Uh, it has 1.265 billion rands worth of debt and its interest bill rose by 35% in the period, in the six months that we're talking about. This is mainly because of rising interest rates. But it is a highly geared and therefore risky business. But it is very well established and it is profitable. And we believe the share is cheap at current levels on a price earnings ratio of 12.4 and a, div a dividend yield of about 5%. Technically, it's now in an upward trend and it is recovering steadily from COVID-19. And we believe it will continue to recover as more and more institutions become interested. Ladies and gentlemen, that sums up what I have for you this month. I hope that you found something in all of that that was of interest and use to you. Uh, I will, of course, be speaking again to you on the first Wednesday in December, so make a note of that. Otherwise, I hope that you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you very much for listening.